field worker ergonomics webinar and just kind of a, a unique one um, in terms of you know, normally we offer a monthly webinar, and so this is kind of in addition to that, in a kind of a, a follow-up to some interesting workshops that we've been hosting recently, and thought that we would really want to share some of this information that we've been kind of collecting and uh, and the conversations we've been having. So I uh, want to introduce myself. I'm Sarah Snabel. I'm one of the co-owners of Pro Ergonomics. I'm a registered kinesiologist as well as a certified professional ergonomist, and um, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background information on pro ergonomics um, we are an ergonomics consulting firm we do a lot of consulting and training um, with a whole variety of different organizations um, in different industries my specialty in particular tends to be municipalities and um, kind of i guess public sector in general but a lot of municipalities a little bit of healthcare is kind of where my background has been and uh, our team is quite diverse, and that's one of the things that I really love about our team is that we all kind of have different backgrounds, as, you know, specialized in kind of kinesiology and ergonomics, but each of us kind of has our own uh, kind of unique stream that we seem to follow, you know, whether it be manufacturing or um, colleges and education or, you know, food manufacturing. We've kind of been in a whole variety of industries, and our team really works well together to kind of make sure that, you know, when you go into a client that we're we're kind of giving the most experienced person, but then also working behind the scenes to really support um, each other. And and all of us kind of diversify our knowledge that as much as we may be a kind of a specialist in one stream, that we become a, a generalist in lots of other areas as well. So uh, all of us are registered kinesiologists and certified ergonomists uh, or pretty darn close to being a certified ergonomist with the associate ergonomist designation so we're all working towards that designation now. muted so um you know about 40 45 minutes um we'll try to cap it at that and just to kind of give you that background information, I know um, some of you may be familiar with the workshops that we've been hosting, but you know, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about field worker ergonomics? Well, we do a lot of work with municipalities. I think we've tallied recently that ab about 40% of our uh, clients are in the municipality sector, and we do a lot of job demands assessments with them. So looking at the physical and cognitive demands of the job. Um, and we do a little bit of office ergonomics with them too. And something that you know we've been talking with current clients about is is you know how do we branch beyond that, or how do they branch beyond that? They want to be doing more in terms of ergonomics, but you know right now we've kind of been in doing helping them with these areas, and so we we identify that as a potential gap. But we're hearing that from our clients too, is that they want to be able to do more uh, beyond the office and. Ta-da! Hence the workshop um, outside the office addressing ergonomic issues in the field. Um, hence that topic was born, and so it kind of started back in June when OMSRA, the Ontario Municipality Health and Safety Representative Association, held their um, conference. So that you guys have that conference uh, every two years, and this year they decided to do some pre-conference workshops for the first time, and they approached us about our interest in doing one, and we thought, yeah, you know what? We love doing education. We love doing training. We love doing workshops. So uh, kind of looking at what we thought might be a really interesting topic for the health and safety group in municipalities, um, you know, we came up with this addressing ergonomics in the field workshop. And we hosted it on June 1st as a pre-conference workshop and then uh, had a good amount of interest in that where we actually had another group in the Simcoe County area. They had their uh, a small networking group and they were interested in the workshop but couldn't make it on June 1st. So actually asked us to run it again in their area. And so we just did that recently on September 15th. And what we found is that there was, um, and, and what, are, what we're hearing is that there's a lot of commonalities obviously between the municipalities. Uh, you guys are a very strong networking group um, talking, sharing resources, and so what we thought is that we would kind of summarize what we've been hearing and learning in these workshops to kind of pass on to to yourselves, right, to other municipalities, uh, be able to summarize that and and enable you to further that networking and resource sharing. So in terms of kind of how the flow will go today, is these are the questions I'm going to answer for you. So 
why is it hard? Why is it so hard to address field ergonomics? You know, and we'll we'll talk a lot about what is the field, right? I'm going to define that uh, as well, and also answer where to start. So, you know, you could have a large number of field workers, and when I say field workers, many of you may be thinking different areas, and it could be because of a problem you have on the go right now. It could be, you know, maybe your portfolio, um, but Either way, when you're looking at field ergonomics, field worker ergonomics, where are you going to start? How are you going to do an evaluation? Where are you going to focus? And then ultimately, how are you going to make it sustainable? So how, you know, what steps are you going to take? And, and how do you kind of grow and keep it going from there? So this is, today is a part one. And so that last question, how to make it sustainable, um, we are going to touch on it today, but we are going to build on that for part two. So part two is going to be more about uh, the action steps. So, you know, we're going to talk about where you focus and then part two will be uh, kind of reviewing, you know, giving you that summary of, you know, what our municipality clients and our workshop attendees are are kind of taking away as, you know, this is what we're going to take, this is what we're going to try to do next. And so kind of giving you those tips um, to summarize that and that, you know, really trying to figure out what steps you guys can take and then how would you make that sustainable. So how do you take the action and how do you make it sustainable? So today we'll kind of start with the the precursor. So starting with why is this so hard? So you know we we uh, we know that um, office ergonomics is something that most municipalities are already addressing, right? And you know many of you have many of you have the health and safety background. Some of you may wear many hats in the sense where your HR and health and safety. I know that depends on the size of your municipality. Uh, and so ergonomics is you know, a component of, of your safety program. And office ergonomics, you know, it tends to be a little bit more cookie cutter. And I think it is a, a nice easy way or an easy place to start uh, because, you know, you do one or two workstation setups, you know, you can standardize to a chair, a keyboard tray, a adjustable monitor, um, you know, whatever that equipment is that will set somebody up at a computer workstation. And you kind of take that application at one workstation and then duplicate it or multiply it you know, across your 100 office workers. And so it can be an easy place to start and definitely, you know, a good place to start because you're going to hit a whole no large number of people. But when you try to apply that to the field, you know, we've got a lot of varied work, work environments and it's not as cookie cutter, right? Now, uh, you, we could be talking about your roads and transportation department. Maybe you're, you're picturing the people who are out doing the tree brush cutting or pothole patching, sign repairs, or your water and wastewater department, uh, parks and recreation, so the people who are cutting the grasses, maintaining your sports fields, working in the arenas, the pools. Uh, some of you may have long-term care facilities or you know, paramedics or other EMS services, and maybe that's who you're thinking of when it comes to field workers. Uh, basically, we're trying to think of all those people who aren't working directly in an office, right? The ones who have the, the different jobs, <laughs> usually a little bit more physical, usually a little less sitting all day uh, at a computer. So we're seeing a lot of varied work environments. And uh, as well, not only, not only are we seeing many different departments or groups, but within each of those departments or groups, uh, seeing varied work environments in there, you know, they're working year round. So we're seeing seasonal effects. Um, you know, you could be working if you're on the roads crew, maybe you're working doing pothole patching one day and then the next day you're doing sign repair and the next day you're, you know, doing tree removal. So you're working in a ditch um, or repairing a culvert. So you're down in a pit, uh, you know, like e even from day to day, your environments can be super varied um, even within one department seeing a lot more manual work, so a lot less, um, you know, sitting at a computer and a lot more lifting, shoveling, um, carrying of supplies, uh, tools, handling of tools, and larger pieces of equipment. So we're seeing a lot more of that work. We're seeing lifting that is not a box. <laughs> I think that's the easiest way to say it is that, you know, we're not, you know, in an office, you know, you think about what's the heaviest thing you might lift or what is it that you're lifting and people will often say, well, you know, a stack of files or a box of files or a box of paper, or a stack of paper. You know, it's the examples aren't usually endless. They're pretty limited and uh, usually it's a box. You know, it's something that 
is relatively straightforward. I can, you know, I can give you some really straightforward tips on how to lift that, how to use good technique. And when you see your field workers, they're lifting things like trees, or they're lifting, you know, um, a jackhammer, they're lifting a pole saw, you know, things that are not a box, things that are different, they don't, they're not always heavy, uh, they could be a really weird shape, and they could be heavy, and, uh, and also a weird shape, you know, think of a, a big chunk of concrete, for example, if you're breaking up a sidewalk. Some of the tasks in the field may be repetitive, and we kind of use the term repetitive based on, um, you know, we, it's open, it's not always a, a when we think about repetitive, we often think of it at kind of in a manufacturing line, like usually the first idea that comes to my mind, the first image that comes in my mind is, you know, working on an assembly line and it's repeated. Uh, you do the same task every 30 seconds all day or for a set number of hours for your shift. And out in the field, there may not be that same element of repetition, but there would be elements of repetition for sure. So, you know, if you're the brush cutting crew, you, the repetition is loading all the pile of brush into the chipper. Right? But then the next day, or you know, maybe you do that for two hours, maybe you do it for a whole shift, and the next day you're doing something totally different. Um, and so it was repetitive for that day or for that shorter chunk of time, but not necessarily repetitive day over day. You know, so there may be some variety in tasks, but within each task there could be elements of repetition. And again, seeing a ton of different pieces of equipment, vehicles, you know, I've listed a couple of examples, but you know, that is a list that goes on and on and on. Um, I can't possibly remember every piece of equipment or vehicle, you know, that I've seen out in the field. But, you know, the point is that there is a very long list. You know, we could be talking about equipment that you're using within the arena, like within the, the community center, the recreation center. Um, so it could be some custodial equipment. It could be some of the, the pool maintenance supplies. Um, could be the the blade on the ice resurfacer. And then you're talking about all of the equipment and vehicles that they might use in the parks department. So when they're out maintaining the sports field, cutting the grass, you know, to your roads and transportation crew. So all those tools, equipment that they might need to repair a culvert, you know, so the equipment gets a little bigger. So definitely it's hard because it's not it's not a cookie cutter approach. So office ergonomics is kind of a great way to practice. And then when you want to go in a, and take kind of your program or whatever you've developed for your office staff and then take it out to your other departments, it gets a little tricky because it's not, you know, it's not easy to just transfer uh, with a, a drag and drop or a copy and paste. Some of the other things that, you know, we're hearing a lot of is that um, it's just kind of the Potentially the employee focus or their mindset in terms of wanting or be feeling their their ability or their their thoughts, I guess, on whether or not they can change their job. Right. So, you know, it is the way it is. You know, you think of um, more of that construction environment and, you know, the job is hard. It's physical. You can't change it. This is the way I've always done it. You know, these are the kinds of barriers that we hear. It's kind of like, well, you know, how are we going to address field ergonomics? Why is it so hard? well, gosh, we're going to be trying to change uh, the mentality of people who have been doing it the same way for a long time, uh, people who feel that there's not really a lot of opportunity for change. How can you possibly make, you know, my job, I have to use a jackhammer. How can you possibly make that any easier? So, you know, hearing a lot of that, uh, that it's going to be very hard to change behaviors and mindsets. Um, as well, it can be hard because, again, because of that diversity and thinking like how how would we do that change um we could spend a lot of time resources energy focus you know and i could improve the pole saw for you know the tree cutting crew um and i've you know that's great i've helped them but i've you know spent a lot of resources on you know fixing or addressing this one issue and it affects maybe 10 people you know when you think about that or compare it to the office environment where you could standardize to an office chair that you know, you then provide to all of your office staff and you, you know, the time and resources that you've spent on that activity, that change has now uh, affected all of your office staff, which could be 100, 200 people, you know, maybe more. So sometimes um, doing some small changes might impact a smaller group as opposed to, you know, in an office environment, you can make a small change. And again, because of that copy and paste or that cookie cutter approach, it can affect a larger number of people. 
probably the number one thing that we heard, and I mean, this is gonna, this was no surprise really to us, and also I'm sure no surprise to you, but the number one thing that we're hearing is is just resources, money, time, oh, time for sure. So for you, uh, maybe you're the only one who's doing health and safety or ergonomics, and that's on top of whatever other tasks are on your plate as well. How can I possibly have the time to go out and you know do a program or whatever it is I need to do to address my field workers? Right, to look at the ergonomics out there. So for sure, I think resources in terms of finances, money, and time were two of the the number one things that we heard when doing this workshop. You know, first things of like, okay, why haven't we have why haven't we started doing field worker ergonomics or you know, time, money, don't really have a lot of it. <laughs> so those are the number one things we were hearing. So in terms of getting started, um, you know, where do you start? And sometimes deciding where to start can be the most overwhelming factor. And for sure, that was a very common thing that we were hearing in our workshop groups um, is that, okay, well, where do we start? And so we were trying to think about ways, you know, brainstorming ways that we could prioritize or get started, right? So where would you get information on starting? You know, you've got your roads crew, water, parks, recreation, uh, paramedics, your waste collectors, you know, fill in the blanks there in terms of what departments are applicable for your municipality. Um, but where would you start? So where would you start looking at some information and kind of looking at that? We we talked about, well, you know, if we don't know off the top of our head, you know, have we seen every job and how do we know which one is a higher priority than the others? We could look at some injury statistics. We could look at um, a department that has you know, more employees than the other in terms, you know, just kind of look at volume. How often is a task done? You know, so if there's a task that's really only done, you know, maybe some event setups are done at the start of the year, uh, maybe one or two in the middle of the year, maybe, you know, clean up. Um, you know, a lot of parks will do kind of park setup, park opening at the, in the spring, and then park close up in the fall. And so maybe those are the tasks that you, you know you wanna look at, but because they don't happen every day, you know, potentially that's something that you might prioritize lower. Again, these are all kind of ideas of, of what we might look for, right? Frequency, um, just feedback in general from staff. You know, some departments could be potentially more vocal. Maybe you've heard more about something that's hazardous or, you know, that would be a really good opportunity for change, just, you know, in hearsay from the staff, the frontline staff, the field workers. Um, how many hazards might be present in the job, if you've ever had risk assessments or anything done where you've actually been able to quantify or, or score a risk rating. And, you know, the big thing really was that what we were hearing is that they, they hadn't necessarily identified hazards, right? So we might have come up with some ideas on where we would start, and then it's kind of, well, okay, well, how do we look at that, you know, often you have your safety hat on. And so this was a, a big thing that I'm always trying to encourage is that when you're gonna look at ergonomics, especially if you haven't really paid a lot of attention to ergonomics for your field staff, uh, it is easy for you to get bogged down in some of the safety hazards, right? You've got you know, some big hazards, like you've got a chipper that could chop somebody's arm off, right? It, it's uh, That's a big safety hazard. We've got some tools, we're, you know, we're worried about trip hazards, fall hazards, cutting, um, you know, getting cut, getting crushed. There's a lot of, of really big safety hazards. And the reality is when we're talking about ergonomics, we're trying to prevent those MSDs, the musculoskeletal disorders, the strains and sprains. They are not injuries that are going to kill somebody. Yes, they can be um, debilitating and they can be costly. They can be, can have quite a negative effect, right? On the person, on the workforce, on the team. Um, but the reality is, is that they're not going to kill somebody. And so they often get bumped as a lower priority. And so if many of you are kind of nodding along and thinking, you know what, yeah, we haven't really started, we haven't really started doing any uh, ergonomics for the, our, our different field areas, you know, for our different um, outdoor departments. Um, what I would suggest to you is to really, you know, go out there and look at these jobs, go out and see them, but put on your ergonomic glasses. And what I mean by that is try to turn off your safety, um, your safety vision. So try not to think about all of those other hazards, right? And just think about the MSD hazards, just looking at the ergonomics. And, you know, the big three when it comes to ergonomics, 
uh, in terms of, of hazards and you know what can increase your risk of a musculoskeletal disorder are force, posture, repetition. So you're going to go out and look at tasks. And if you've gone out and done you know a safety risk assessment, you know you're sort of going out and doing your ergonomic risk assessment, but really just looking at these postures. Force is a relatively easy one to see, or it's a little bit more obvious. But what you'll find is that it that you see it everywhere. Right? It's lifting a bag of garbage. It's lifting the blade on the ice resurfacer, uh, loading branches and and logs to the chipper, lifting the equipment, power tools, jackhammers. Um, saws, it's um, handling all of the tools like shoveling, raking, you know, there's a lot of application of force. It's usually one you could probably create a pretty long list of. Posture for, for sure, you're going to see a lot of awkward postures and uh, repetition potentially you're going to see, but again, remember I said it's more of like a in a task by task basis. You're likely not seeing you know, a ton of repetition as like when you're comparing to an assembly line. So you're looking at repetition in a bit of a different way. Other things you might see is you know, contact stress. If they're doing a lot of kneeling or I often describe contact stress as kind of just using your body as a hammer or an, a piece of your body as a hammer, like using your hand to smash a to smash something in. Um, it could also be temperature. It could be you know, if you're looking outdoors, so cold environments, hot environments. You know, vibration of the tools or even vibration from driving all of the different vehicles. So those are kind of the the hazards that you're looking at when we're talking about how to address field worker ergonomics. So we want to look at these elements. Um, and so we were talking a lot about, well, how would we go out and do that? So Again, kind of suggesting that time and resources were one of the bigger barriers in terms of, of getting started or why haven't we done a whole ton to date. Um, and so we want to be able to evaluate those. And, and a lot of our discussion became around, well, how, how would we do that? You know, again, I don't have the time or resources, but looking at what you're already doing and uh, are you including ergonomics in it? So again, many of you are wearing your health and safety hats. Um, and are you including ergonomics regularly in any of your inspections, in any of your risk assessments, in any of the already occurring regular tasks that you're doing? And for the most part, uh, what we were hearing is, is no. I mean, it was a bit of a mixed bag, but most were not actively including or formally identifying MSD hazards um, in any kind of a regular capacity more so on an accommodation or an as needed uh, like a firefighting type of basis is what we were hearing but uh, definitely not a lot of, of programs out there or formal processes and so uh, in terms of like you know where would you get started and uh, one of the common um, areas that that we spoke about that came up was about using your joint health and safety committee um, so you know they're a good example anyways of, of a committee that's going out and they're already doing monthly inspections they have a checklist that they're following and so we started talking about well how many people actually have MSD hazards so the force the posture the repetition you know questions related to those hazards on their joint health and safety committee inspection checklist you know or even a separate checklist you know something right so you know we do it for safety hazards are we doing it for those MSD hazards? Are we looking at ergonomics in any capacity, uh, equivalent or not, um, to safety? And so, again, it was a very mixed bag kind of an answer. And it, in many ways, it kind of depended on, well, you know, honestly, I thought it was going to depend on the size of the municipality. You know, maybe a larger municipality might be a little bit more advanced, but uh, that was actually not a trend that we necessarily saw, not consistently anyways. And so it kind of just depended on resources or um, in some cases it depended on um, like whether or not an injury had happened and and whether they'd kind of use that as a springboard for change. You know, we saw a couple of different reasons, but some of the trends that I was kind of anticipating didn't necessarily match up. You know, but what we did think is that for a lot of the safety processes that you have in place, it is a, a standardized or a, a process, right? So you have that in place and incorporating ergonomics into that is something that, uh, that everybody in our workshops actually agreed upon that would be a, a, a good thing to start whether 
whether they were already doing it, uh, formalizing it was definitely something that needed to happen. And so what we did was we actually kind of started off the sessions with a mind mapping exercise. So kind of asking them, all right, you think about your field workers. So let's kind of think about all of the different areas, you know, you know, kind of put them into small groups and ask them to really think about um, hazards, ergonomics, MSD hazards, kind of throwing out a bunch of words there. So challenges, barriers, um, and then trying to ultimately come up with a connection connection between all of them. And so this actually was a super fun activity because uh, everybody kind of interpreted a little bit differently. You know, we gave them some big chart paper and had them just say, okay, write down, you know, words that come to mind when it comes to field worker ergonomics, right, in terms of, you know, whether it be tools or equipment or processes or tasks. And everybody kind of took that to mean something a little bit different. You know, some people were doing uh, bubble diagrams. Other people had more words with bullet points. Um, it was really interesting to kind of see how everybody mapped out their mind when it came to uh, drawing uh, those keywords and then making the connections. Um, but regardless of how people approach the activity, what we were finding is that we were seeing uh, three big commonalities, you know, and trying to connect all of those pictures, connect all of those words, you know, having crazy lines drawing all over the paper. Um, and we were really finding that everything kind of tied back to three main categories, right? So if we kind of, we looked at the challenges, right? We had talked about all of that, but ultimately uh, challenges or hazards or tasks uh, all kind of came back to being able to group them under um, three main categories. One was about vehicles. So it didn't really matter which kind of field we were talking about, you know, park, recreation, roads, um, paramedic, waste collection, you know, we were we were talking about vehicles. It could be a pickup truck, it could be a dump truck, a loader, a backhoe, a mower, a forklift, you know, we, ultimately we kind of took all of these vehicles that we were seeing and categorized them into one big heading of vehicles. And then similarly, we had equipment, so lots of hand tools, power tools, backpack blowers, chainsaws, pole saws, uh, et cetera, the list went on, but ultimately they're all grouped under equipment. And then uh, force came up a whole lot, right? And and not necessarily that we were always using the word force, but we were talking about uh, more so the tasks that people were doing out in the field. So things like, uh, mostly it came down to lifting, right? We, we often said the word like awkward lifting, we said uh, heavy lifting, and then the examples of things that they were lifting was you know, a, a huge long list, you know, ranging from a tree to a person, right, in long-term care or in paramedics, you, you're lifting, your object is now as a person. Um, in roads, maybe it's that you're lifting chunks of concrete, you're lifting shovels, you know, we had so many variety of tasks, uh, but really kind of the more we looked at each group that kind of did this, this activity, they all fell into these three main categories. And it's ultimately where we spent a lot of our time talking in this workshop um, was about those three main categories. So what I'm going to do is kind of summarize a little bit about our discussion to kind of give you some ideas on, you know, where our conversations went. When we talked about vehicles, uh, what are some opportunities for change or improvement there from an ergonomic perspective? And then this will be a good uh, kind of lead in because next webinar, part two, um, is then talking about the the tips for action. So great, we're talking about some ideas today. Uh, you know how what our groups kind of came up with on on how they could address these or what they would address when it comes to vehicle ergonomics, equipment ergonomics, um, lifting. And then next week is kind of more tips on on you know ways that we thought we could actually do this, right? So we talk about vehicle ergonomics, though you don't necessarily, you can talk about a barrier, don't necessarily have a lot of opportunity for change. Or at least that was the first thing, was like, okay, yeah, they use a ton of equipment, but what is it that we can change? And, you know, it comes down to posture or length of time that they're sitting in there. And so we want to look for some opportunities that we can improve their posture, for example. So uh, how many of you, and I'll ask this question to you, just you know, I can't see you, but I know you're listening. How many of you actually know what adjustments the vehicles for your field workers do? 
So if you were to go out and look at a pickup truck, dump truck, a, lo a loader, would you know what adjustments that seat does? Would you know how to adjust it? Would you know where to look? And do you know if your workers actually know how to adjust it? Right? And if you're assuming that, yeah, they know how to adjust it because they work in those vehicles every day, then you know, I'm going to let you know that, you're, that that assumption is probably not correct or not accurate, right? Just because somebody sits in a vehicle every day uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to adjust it or that they are actually actually adjusting it, right? That same principle actually applies in office ergonomics, right? And I'm, I'm sure you've seen that is that you could give somebody the Cadillac of office chairs, can have all the bells and whistles of adjustability on it, but are people using it? <laughs> or, um, you know, they say my chair is super uncomfortable. I need a new chair, and it turns out that they just need to do some adjustments to it. Okay, this is very similar when it comes to vehicle ergonomics, and it is something that we talked a lot about in terms of, you know, what can you adjust? So very often the seat has probably more adjustability than you would think, right? Uh, some vehicles may have very minimal adjustability, and some will have a ton of adjustability, and then some will surprise you, right? They'll have way more adjustability than you think. And it could be things like the seat going up and down, forward and back. Uh, maybe some of the seating in the trucks has lumbar support. For sure, I've seen that out there. Uh, not all of them. Steering wheels can go up and down, in and out. All the mirrors, potentially there's control panels or joysticks. And uh, many of that does have adjustability as well. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a ton of adjustability, but there is some adjustability there. And so it kind of came down to, well, do the workers know how to use them? Do they know that that adjustability is there? Do they know how to use them? And are they actually doing it? Uh, and vehicle ergonomics can be with adjusting the actual seating itself, as well as uh, getting in and out of the vehicle. You know, that can be a really big deal for the larger vehicles, the larger trucks, you know, when you're climbing up and down the two or three steps to get in, and uh, as well as loading and unloading. So, you know, we talked about all of the equipment potentially that would be going in and out of a truck or you know to do all of these tasks and well reality is the equipment has to get to and from the site and so uh, they got to load it in and out of the truck and so that would be an opportunity as well when we're talking about vehicles there was lots of different areas that we thought was opportunity for improvement or an opportunity to apply ergonomics When it came to equipment, again, this was kind of our big general heading, and the list of items that we had for equipment uh, started getting really huge, <laughs> like really huge and pretty diverse. You know, again, it could be talking about saws, it could be talking about backpack blowers, hand and power tools, uh, shovels, um, and then you're kind of thinking about the different the different types of uh, uh, fields, right? So, I mean, if we're talking in long-term care, if you're counting those as field workers, if that's an area uh, under your belt, on your, in your portfolio, then you've got some lift assist, right? You've got the, the lift that actually help lift the patients or transport them or the clients, the residents. Um, you've got a whole variety of different equipment here. And so we were talking a lot about, well, what can be done? You know, you, you've got a pole saw, you've got a chainsaw, um, it is what it is, right? It is the weight that it is. And so looking at, well, what are some other opportunities here? Are we positive that, you know, that is absolutely the chainsaw that's needed, you know? Is it possible that we could look for one that's a lower weight, a lower vibration, uh, those kinds of things? Maybe with a pole saw or um, a weed trimmer, for example. Those are some equipment that you can buy straps for. And having that support might be an opportunity to kind of distribute or balance the weight as opposed to somebody just lifting and carrying the tool you know and so our discussions kind of went into we used a couple of examples like the ones here that I'm mentioning and kind of talked about okay well again we've got some general headings here so looking for potentially lower weight tools looking for ways where you could support the weight if something was you know a weed trimmer is not necessarily heavy right they're usually 10 pounds or less uh, but the reality is is that when they're when people are using it they're using it for an hour two hours at a time potentially even for a large percentage of their day and so 10 pounds over the length of the day uh, does kind of get heavy does get pretty straining on the body also looking at some opportunities for 
you know, gripping styles. Um, so, you know, yes, you have to use that that tool, that piece of equipment, that very specific piece of equipment. But is there opportunities, you know, to look at another model, another style, kind of an add-on piece, those kinds of things. Um, and it, you know, again, the, op the options here uh, could be numerous and it may seem overwhelming. Um, but we know we talked a little bit too about standardizing equipment or um, looking at the purchasing specs here, the specifications. And so you yourself may not necessarily be involved in this, but this was a really interesting discussion that we had uh, with within the workshops here was was maybe about getting more the like concluding ergonomics as part of the uh, so I'm trying to think of the word like the specification process. So before you order equipment, right? The department might go out, they want to order equipment, they maybe they put it in RFP if it's a big enough um, purchase. And then then uh, you know who kind of gets the final say in terms of of purchasing, right? So sometimes it's the purchasing department and, you know, are they really looking at ergonomics? So it could, it was definitely an opportunity here to kind of look at some of these ergonomic features, almost like creating a checklist to kind of be put into thought before equipment was purchased. So we'll talk a little bit more about that too, actually, because that came up as a really good action item, right? You know, kind of looking at the purchasing standards or getting involved in a purchasing committee or purchasing group uh, to kind of make sure that those elements of ergonomics are looked at before equipment is purchased, especially some of the bigger, more expensive equipment. Another thing that we talked about, again, this kind of came down to the task, was all about lifting. You know, we come up with those lists of tasks they do that requires lifting. And we were talking about anything from signs to catch basins to tools to chunks of concrete to people to bags of garbage. You know, again, a really long list of items. And the common thing really between all of those items that are lifted is that, guess what? They're not standard. The environment can vary, right? We could be um, lifting the same item potentially, you know, over day over day or week over week, uh, but in different environments in the sense that it could be spring, fall, winter, raining, maybe there's snow, ice, you know, you've got some variety of weather conditions. You've got um, non-standard in the sense that it's not a box. How many of those those things that you're picturing your field workers lifting, how many of them have handles? You know, we have that, that old adage of lifting training, well, lift with your legs, not with your back. And that's great. And that diagram, you know, and it is true, that is kind of the, the core principles, the core foundation of lifting training, you know, but the pictures and the training that's often used is very much demonstrated with a box. And, you know, what you'll find if, if you know, we kind of ask, like, a show of hands, how many people are doing lifting training with their staff? And uh, most people, a large percentage of people said that they were doing it. And we said, well, what does that look like? And I think the large majority, um, if not 100%, agreed that it's probably not ideal, right? It's probably not, it's not customized necessarily to the specific items that our field workers are lifting. It's very much, you know, maybe it's a video, maybe it's some posters, maybe it's some um, some handouts, that kind of thing, um, but it's very much kind of focused around this picture that I have here with the green heading, right? The picture of the person holding a box. Um, and so what you're likely finding is, you know, is, is that lifting training working for you? Is it? Like it, you're giving the training and kind of great, you're, you're checking off your compliance um, checklist there in terms of, you know, I've provided some training. But if people aren't actually using or applying that training, then it could be just really a waste of time. Um, and there's probably a, a much better way of doing it, or at least a more specific way of doing it that, you know, your, your workers aren't necessarily rolling their eyes, right? They've likely tuned out as soon as you kind of say, lift with your legs, not with your back, you know, and they've kind of, they've checked out because they're picturing their real work environment, not this classroom setting, you know, where they're watching a video of somebody lifting a box, right? Great, doesn't apply to me. Sure, I'll sit here and I'll sign off on the training. Anyways, those are some of the conversations that we were having that that is very typically how lifting training um, looks. And, and so we did a lot of talking actually about how this training could be done differently, right? Making it very specific and customized. And I would say that it was probably top two, top three 
for sure in terms of um, action items that our attendees were leaving thinking like, you know what, this might be an area that I'm going to start on. And it was talking about um, addressing lifting training kind of with a new perspective, with a bit of a new focus, more customized, very specific to what the workers are actually lifting, right? So instead of doing it in a classroom, you know, talking about how we could do it more in the field, using items that are, you know, that they actually use, uh, maybe doing some problem solving or um, uh, what's the word, like hands-on work with them, right? So have them load up a truck or unload a truck and then kind of coaching and, and problem solving. Uh, how would you do that lifting better? Or how could you do this? Given the scenario, how might you do this differently? Or what are the best practices? You know, and those core principles still apply, but it was a really interesting conversation that we had in terms of how you could make this a little bit different to really apply to your field workers since it was such a common task um, within all the groups, even though all of the items themselves are different. For sure, our topics kind of kept coming back to this major barrier. Great, I'd love to do more customized lifting training, but reality, like, it's me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm it. So what am I supposed to do? How can I possibly get around? You know, we have hundreds of workers. We have, you know, so many different tasks. How can I possibly get out and do that? and vehicle ergonomics and 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 on top of whatever your regular job is as opposed to all of this stuff that we're now introducing it's a great idea um you know and, and you know everybody's motivated great yeah i want to do that but you know let's talk about this barrier i'm a one-man show right and i know that's many of the many of, that's the case for many of you some of you may have a bigger team but at the same time you know your plates are full so you know thinking about who can help you know, looking at your resources that you have available, um, who's already helping you and who might you be able to look to to help you with that, right? And it could be supervisors, managers, workers, your committees, um, and really kind of thinking about how it is that you could use them as a resource to you when trying to implement some ergonomic initiatives for the field workers. I mean, the other kind of barrier really is that uh, many of them are geographically spread out as well. You know, you've got some physical time and physical barriers as well to some of these uh, grand ideas that you may have in terms of how you can address ergonomics. And so, I mean, you wanna make it sustainable. Realistically, again, you are not the only person well, you may be the only person, you feel like the only person who's out there to do it all. You want to be able to use those resources and, and think about who it is that you can get help with, right? Can you get your Joint Health and Safety Committee to help with some of that MSD hazard identification? Can you get your supervisors to help with hazard identification? Can you get... Um, you know, and, and what I would actually suggest really is thinking about, you know, kind of making up your wish list of, you know, all these different, all your resources, all these stakeholders, all these people who can help you and kind of, kind of you kind of coming up with this wish list of what it is that you see them doing. And then, uh, and then, you know, before you think like, oh gosh, they're never going to help. They're already so busy. You know, before you start going really negative, <laughs> thinking about all of the barriers, kind of come up with your wish list or your ideal of who could help you with different stages or different aspects. And, um, and then really thinking about, you know, if there's training, if there's education, if there's something that they might need to kind of help with that, you know, that might be some of your next step, right? But if your managers and supervisors, um, engineering, maintenance, your joint health and safety committee, those are all excellent resources that might help you with that hazard identification stage. If those are the people who are already involved in doing your monthly inspections and, you know, we can get them trained, we can add them, add some MSC um, hazard elements on their monthly checklist, um, that would be a really good resource to you, right? Um, potentially, it's, you know, talking with engineering and maintenance, they might be able to design out some some issues in some of the workstations. They might be able to, you know, maybe purchasing is on this list here of somebody that you might want to get on board with you to kind of help with. Uh, making sure that certain specifications are looked at before equipment is purchased. Your frontline staff, uh, and one of the barriers that we often heard is that, well, I didn't know there was a problem. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't know there was a problem. I, they're not, they are not, uh, they're not telling me that there is a problem or, 
um, possible, and there could be different reasons for that actually, you know, we talked a little bit about that too, but your frontline staff, um, really them reporting to you, getting their involvement in terms of how they can, how you can make changes to their tasks, to their equipment, to how they're doing their job. These are all excellent resources to you. And so really thinking about how you can use them to your advantage as opposed to you having to do it all, right? You can kind of champion and lead and guide them. Um, but really these people should in theory be able to help you out quite a bit. Um, kind of coming back to that employee um, reporting issue too is that we, you know, we talked a lot about the barriers and you know, I haven't heard about it. Uh, I didn't know about it or, you know, just in general, what, what we find with, with some of the field workers is it can depend on the culture as well. Like it's possible that they have spoke up in the past and maybe nothing was done about it. Many of them kind of feel like, oh, well, what can you do? And so in some ways it may be kind of opening up those channels of communication to really um, help get those ideas out. So, you know, that might be a step for you as well. In terms of, you know, where are you going to start? So again, you, the three big categories that we feel are, are really good to kind of start with is the vehicle, the lifting, and the equipment. And you might want to start with, you know, what I'd call almost like a pilot group. So maybe you pick one department. Set yourself up for success in the sense that you may not necessarily want to pick your most challenging department. Maybe you have one department in mind where you're thinking, you know what, I have some really, I've got some good relationships there. I've got some good, yeah, I've got some people there who could help. I think they'd be open to some of these changes. I think they'd be open to giving us some good feedback communication and it might be a good spot to start, a good, you know, group of people to start with. And uh, you can kind of tweak out some of those you know your process you can kind of start developing it there and then kind of take that and it's kind of that general framework for looking at vehicle equipment lifting and applying that that kind of becomes your cookie cutter to apply to other departments but if you start with one that you know might be i don't know i want to say the word easy but i know that um sometimes when something's new it's not ever really easy but i'm thinking a department you know where you do have that good relationship that would be a good spot potentially to start with as opposed to starting with the one where you know you you potentially get a lot of resistance um, so starting in a spot that's gonna you know start small and then kind of grow and adapt and and apply it elsewhere and then plan ahead. And I know that this isn't necessarily a, sometimes this isn't always easy. You know, we talk about those financial resources that it's really tough. Where are you going to get the money? You know, we already have tight with our budget. We have so many things. Um, one thing that we see a lot of, you know, with us, us being consultants in particular is that we get a lot of calls at year end. So, you know, I've got a bunch of money. I need to, I need to spend it or I'm going to lose it. You know, you don't use it, you lose it. And so kind of with that, and that's fine. We, you know, We'll help out we do help out um but what it does kind of signify is that it wasn't necessarily planned right or that maybe you were saving it to kind of use for something else but it wasn't really planned so if you're thinking that maybe some of these changes are going to going to need some financial support maybe thinking ahead to your next budget year you know how much money did you spend this year and then looking ahead to how you might allocate those resources next year you know maybe you did x number of jdas this year and then maybe next year, what you might uh, start thinking about is how you might do JDAs and risk assessments, or you might do some training to kind of get more people, more resources on board to help you with that MSD hazard identification, um, with you know engineering or purchasing or supervisors, managers, all of those other different groups to kind of help make sure that they're looking at ergonomics before they're purchasing equipment um, in training. You know, there are, there are other ways that you might be able to kind of plan ahead. And, and sometimes that can seem kind of daunting because it's not something that you can change right now. It, you can't automatically get more money, um, you know, this month, this week. Um, but thinking ahead to the future in terms of how you're going to incorporate ergonomics into your plan. And it may be something like a three or five year plan because realistically, it, you know, it does. It takes time. And so um, that kind of summarizes part one here. And I wanted to just kind of draw your attention really that, I mean, if you have any questions, um, I'll check here. You know, you can use the chat panel along the side of your, um, the webinar here. And let me know if you have any questions. You can always email or call as well if you do have questions. But I wanted to be able to sh kind of share that workshop information with you. And, and you know, that's kind of a an overview of, some of our conversations, these workshops we did 
for three hours, right? They were a three hour workshop, a half day. And, uh, and so by, by all means, it's gonna be quite hard to kind of summarize absolutely everything we talked about in 45 minutes. But we do wanna highlight to your attention too that there's the part two. So don't forget about that. It's next week at one o'clock, um, same day, our first Wednesday, one o'clock. And what we'll talk in that webinar is a lot more about the action. So, you know, I've covered a little bit about um, equipment, lifting, and vehicles, because I think those are the three main categories for sure in both workshop groups. This is where we kept circling back to as those were the three main headings. And then next week, let's talk more. We'll, we'll summarize more about some of those action tips. So what are the types of things that you can do to address vehicle ergonomics? And how might you actually go about doing that? Right, that's the action planning component. So I am going to just check if there are any questions coming in here. It's been a pretty quiet group. <laughs> so I don't see any questions actually. Um, so that's no problem. If you guys have any questions, by all means, give me a call or send an email. And hopefully we will see you next week, October 4th, Field Worker Ergonomics Part Two. Thank you so much for tuning in today and we will see you next week.